Well, I'll tell you what, after that introduction, I just want to say, quit while I'm ahead. Thank you. It's been great being with you. Uh, Joseph, uh, thank you very much uh, for your very kind, very, very kind words, and I did that all by myself. <laughs> the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, before I get uh, into my remarks, is uh, take a look at back at those, uh, those challenging times, and by myself today, and forevermore grateful for the quality of people that uh, provided that critical team around me to help coordinate and drive a lot of the changes that had to be effected right after 9-11. Uh, Joe Rosick himself was my one-man Intel shop until we developed one. You talk about having technology and integrating technology, uh, Joe did it with pins on maps until we build up. We didn't have any technology at headquarters when we started. So, so the bottom line is that uh, I had people like Colonel Joe Rosick, himself a veteran and a patriot uh, with me and many people from the private sector who gave pre up pretty decent salaries and pretty decent jobs and a nine to five life to come in and help build the department. So I'm grateful for the kind words, but uh, I must say that I will I was blessed to have an incredibly group, an incredible group of men and women, public and private, who right after 9-11 said whatever I was doing was important, but working to build an Office of Homeland Security and a Department of Homeland Security is more important than anything else I'm doing. And they did. And I'll always be grateful for that. And I suspect some of you in this room may have been part of that. But I look back to those days, I remember one quick story, and I'll get into uh, my comments. I remember Joe Rosie coming in, this is, this is about information sharing, this is about technology, this is about process. I remember Joe Rosie coming into my office, and remember, he's getting his daily intelligence reports, he's picking up some criminal information from the Department of Justice and everything. He came in to me and he said, you know, there's a pattern of activity, this is without technology, but this is with one man and a, one other individual, assimilating and doing an analysis, he said, there's something going on up there in uh, northwestern New York around Buffalo. I said, what's that, Joe? He said, no, there's, this, there's, this, there's, a, there's a population up there that uh, we're a little suspect. Uh, some of these folks from different parts of the world are potentially suspect. There's some reports of the petty crimes up there. Long story short, he identified, without any technology, the Lackawanna crowd. Remember that group? Now we went over to the FBI I said, what should we do? I said, you better go over and tell the FBI. Well, a couple days later, they said, well, they're a bunch of petty criminals and blah, blah, blah. But obviously, they had a few more resources than he did. But the fact of the matter, that's the kind of talent that we had coming in. That focus, that mission-sensitive, that mission-directed kind of mindset that Joe and a lot of other people brought to me. So again, I don't want to be, and I had a lot of Joes working for me, and I want to I'll for, be forever grateful for that. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to spend some time with you this morning. If you listen, if you saw my background, you'd say Ridge can't hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had seven or eight different paychecks from government. First one was a maintenance crew at a public park. Basically, I was a garbage collector, all the way to become Secretary of Homeland Security in between some military service as a district attorney, as a congressman, the list goes on and on, and now in the private sector. And based on those collective experiences, I've formed some opinions based on experience, those experiences that I'd like to share with you today. Given your mission, given the Institute's mission, and the role that the Institute and you play in advancing America's security interests. Quick story if I might though, I made the transition from public to private rather easily. The biggest challenge, however, was transportation. When I was governor, the state police provided it. When I was in the White House or secretary, the Secret Service provided it. The last day on the job, the Secret Service head of the details said, Mr. Secretary, it's been a pleasure serving you. Good night and good luck. <laughs> I knew what the good night was. I wasn't sure about the good luck. 
Woke up the next morning, my routine every day was really up and out the door, 6, 6.30, down to the White House, get briefing on the way, we met with DHS, we got the CIA briefing, we waited outside the Oval Office until somebody waved us in daily. I had a car. I woke up that morning and I have no vehicle. Oh, I have two cars in the house, my kids have one in school, my wife has the other one elsewhere. I'm free, I'm liberated, I'm now a private citizen, I want to walk through the Montgomery Wall with a cup of coffee. Just kind of hang around. I got no car. <laughs> My son comes home from school later that day and I said, son, dad would like to borrow your car. <laughs> I got the look. You ever get the look? I got the look. I said, son, your dad's leasing the bloody thing. Give me the keys. <laughs> he gave me the keys. He said, dad, two things. I said, son, be respectful to your father. My son is a very respectful young man. He said, two things. I said, now be respectful to your dad. He said, okay, dad, here's the keys. Watch where you're parking. And don't forget to fill it up with gas. <laughs> I made that transition into the private sector. And based on what I've seen and learned in government and what I've seen, observed, and done in the private sector, I'm pleased to share a couple of thoughts with you this morning. First of all, let me say to the Institute, too bad there aren't more of you. You need more members. Your role is absolutely critical. Political figures at the federal, state, and local level talk about public-private partnerships all the time. This is real. And you're focused on the right thing keeping America as safe as we possibly can. One of the things I say this, and I say this respectfully to my friends with whom I've served in government, sometimes they don't get it. It has nothing to do with being registered on one side of the aisle or the other, but pretty much know where I am on this. But frankly, government doesn't exist without the private sector. I know that's anathema to a lot of people on the Hill, but guess what? You can't provide services without the private sector. And the other thing that a lot of people in government don't understand is that it's the private sector that's basically helping you solve the problems that you've identified. So the notion that you bring together the men and women from the public sector and the private sector around technology and information sharing, which is at the epicenter of the relationship between the federal government, the state and local government, and the private sector is absolutely critical. So I commend uh, the members of the organization. I commend the participants. You did some serious work this week. I mean, I saw all the seminars, I saw all the panels. So I'm very, very pleased to be here to share these thoughts with you. We all know the impact of the forces of globalization. We've been thinking about them, lauding them, praising them for decades. The planet has shrunk. Transportation. Finance. Communication. We are an interdependent world, whether we like it or not. And there's many things that have been written about the positive impact of these forces of globalization, about the positive outcomes, the positive consequences for individuals, for companies, for governments. There's no question about it. But the same forces of globalization have created opportunities for others who would do us, would do ill to us or the Western world. Those same forces that would do us harm. And I think you gather and you're basically what you do is get together to try to figure out how working in the public and private sector you can resist that harm, minimize that harm, minimize that risk because we're never going to be able to eliminate it. I hate to say this, but I think my children who are in their late 20s live in a much more complicated world than I did. I think my generation had it better than any generation in the history of America. With the exception of Vietnam, which was the only blip on the screen, we had it better than anybody. Oh, we had the Cold War, but we had rational people on both sides of that Cold War. We had something crazy called mutual assured destruction, but it somehow it worked. But in the 21st century, because of the forces of globalization, I believe there are two permanent conditions around which you have built a collective mission. 
two permanent threats that affect us as a country, affect companies, affect us as individuals. The first is the global scourge of terrorism. It's not going away. And the second is what I call the digital forevermore. The digital sun is never going to get set. The digital sun is never going to set, folks. It's only going to get hotter. And I'd like to share a couple of thoughts with you about that and a couple of principles that I think you collectively, obviously, are probably and probably preaching to the choir, but I think are absolutely critical to the functioning not only of the Institute, but the public private partnership that you are promoting. Think about September 12, 2001. We think about Al Qaeda, we think Pakistan, Afghanistan, maybe offshoots elsewhere. Think about January 2015. Al-Qaeda is not on the run, folks. <laughs> Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Al-Qaeda in the Middle East. Al-Qaeda in North Africa. And small cells elsewhere that we have yet to publicly identify. ISIL is not a JV squad. And the thousands and thousands of people moving in and out of Syria and Iraq are very much a part of today and tomorrow's threat. Iran remains the central bank of terrorism. Yet a lot of people in this town don't quite appreciate that. Hamas, Hezbollah, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and the list goes on and on and on. Certain friends in certain parts of the world are still building mosques to satisfy the Wahhabi element within the religion, the extremist group. Oh no, the global scourge of terrorism is going to be with us for quite some time. And we also know that uh, we need to better understand it's a pretty sophisticated crowd that we're dealing with. We learned after 9-11 that it doesn't take too much money or too many people with a well-planned operation to cause horrific personal suffering and economic damage. We read now that uh, the group in Yemen, we may have gotten al Siri, but uh, they're thinking about different kinds of explosives that's much more difficult to detect. There's a level of sophistication there that I'm afraid sometimes we don't appreciate. Now, I remember shortly after the president asked me to come to the White House when I was addressing a group of individuals and somebody raised their hand after my remarks and said, how do you sleep at night? I said, I don't sleep much, but I sleep all right. He said, well, how, how is that? Why is that? I said, because I'm on the inside and I know how hard people are working day in and day out in the public sector and the private sector to minimize the threat. But let's make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, the global scourge of terrorism, with it's almost a commando attack in France, the individual attack in the parliament in Canada, the one-offs, how about that planned attack in Belgium? We're just beginning to see this percolate to the surface. And at the end of the day, information sharing from the federal government down to the state and local, frankly, you can have all the technology you want, but unless somebody hits that send button down to the state and locals in the private sector, the technology is not going to do you a damn bit of good. I still have a, it's a wonderful thing about being a private citizen. I can say what I doggone well please. <laughs> Had to be careful when I was secretary, you know. When I was governor, I was allowed to make news. <coughs> I'm at the top of the flow chart, accountable, responsible, good, bad, and different. It comes my way. Secretary, you got to be careful. You got to be quiet. You reflect the opinion of the administration. One quick story, if I might. I'm in San Diego. We're talking about border issues and border security. At the end, somebody from the press comes up and said, well, what do you think we ought to do? 
So I laid out the Riggs plan. I thought about it a long time. Agriculture is the number one industry in Pennsylvania. We got to take care of migrant workers. Sometimes they brought their families, by the way. I think most of them were legal. Good people working hard. Most of them want to work in our fields and go back home. So I laid out the Ridge Plan. If I, you know, I'd say we had to do A, B, C, D, E, F. So good, I laid it out there big time. And we're walking in the car and my press secretary says, you did it now. <laughs> I said, what do I do? You laid out a pretty fulsome immigration plan. I said, well, you asked me a question. I gave him an answer. What's wrong with that? A couple hours later, we got a call from the White House. What the hell are you doing laying out an immigration plan when the president hasn't laid out his? <laughs> Now I can tell you whatever I think and not worry about getting a call from the White House. <laughs> Here's what I think. I think we ought to be a little bit more forthcoming and trusting with the information the federal government shares with the state and the locals and the private sector. That's what I think. Because you can't secure the country from inside the beltway. No way, no how. I think some of the information is overclassified because that gives people a reason not to share it. If we can't trust one another with some of this sens sensitive information, my view is, who can we trust? We're getting better, but boy, I think we got a long way to go. It still bothers me that Ed Davis didn't know that he had two terrorists in Boston until after the explosion. And he happened to be the commissioner of police. It bothers me that the State Department didn't tell DHS that a father had come into the, uh, their office and said, well, I think my son has uh, been, has been proselytized and he's in Yemen and he may become a terrorist. And by the way, remember the, the Detroit bomber? And the list goes on and on. At some point in time, we have to start trusting. We have to share that information. Somebody has to hit the send button. And frankly, I don't, uh, I just hope we can accelerate the progress in that regard because it's still a problem since 9-11 and here we are almost 15 years later and I'm still agitated by the difficulty it is to build a, a, a trusting relationship with people from the state and local level and our friends in the private sector because government cannot operate without the private sector. So you take this problem with the global scourge of terrorism and you take a look at the forces of globalization and you start thinking internet. How do they proselytize? How do they advocate? How potentially, not so much finance, um, but how do they train? How do they educate? That brings us to the second permanent condition that this country is gonna have to deal with and your institute and the public private sector that you promote is going to have to uh, help this country respond to. And that's the digital forevermore. We live in a hyper-connected world. When you think about the internet, think where we've come since those big monstrous machines at the University of Pennsylvania that maybe filled this room and you got more computing power in your watch. But also think about the nature of the internet. An open system, not designed for security. The ubiquity of the internet is its strength and the ubiquity of the internet is its weakness. It's the digital forevermore. The sun is never set and it's gonna get a lot harder. It is a clear, present, and permanent danger to this country and to companies. And we're not gonna even get into the notion of privacy and some of those other related and very important issues in terms of your mission. But it is a clearly a challenge for all of us the barbarians are no longer at the gate. They are inside. They are oftentimes exquisitely concealed. And I think that's a chilling and a permanent reality that the country and companies and citizens are going to have to deal with. Who are those barbarians? Well, we pretty much know nation states, Hacktivists, terrorist groups, hackers for hires, individuals. What are the objectives? Well, depending on the objective, you pretty much identify the barbarian. Is it disruption? Is it espionage? 
Is it sabotage? Is it theft? Those objectives have been around and involved in government and society for hundreds and hundreds of years. But there's a new means to accomplish those goals. It's the internet. And we get very excited about the internet of things. You know, we see the capacity of the internet growing, the applications growing, and so does the vulnerability. Everybody's excited about the Internet of Things. I read somewhere by 2020 or 2025, there might be 20 billion devices hooked to the Internet. A couple of billion people having access to it. And potentially, everyone, every point of access is a point of vulnerability. Some are obviously more vulnerable than others. Again, extra extraordinary impact, positive impact on the global community. But the perils of the internet remain a very much a part of what the world is going to also have to deal with. The other thing we need to understand is they're motivated, they're resourceful, and many of them are highly financed. You know, I'm not too sure about this whole North Korean deal. I've got uh, some friends who don't think it was necessarily initiated by North Korea, may have been using their network to get to us. It's immaterial, they did it. I get one aside to me is, I don't know how many of you were, this, this is a casual comment I made, how many of you thinking a comedy around the assassination of an existing leader of a foreign country would attract you to the box office? I, that escapes me that maybe I missed something there. But the fact of the matter, they did it. And I think the chances are pretty good. They may have got the tools from somebody else, maybe a neighboring country. Because the one thing we know about North Korea is they don't care what anybody says about them. So if a, a somebody in the region decided that, well, we're going to exploit your system and work through your network into uh, Sony, maybe that'd be just fine. I think there was probably an insider involved somehow, somewhere. That's the reality of the 21st century. We know they're stealing military secrets. We know they've gone after intellectual property. We know others have, uh, like that personal ID, get that information, turn into credit cards, draw it down. That's the world within which we live in, and that's the world where information plus technology is absolutely critical to reduce the risk of the negative impact on individuals, companies, and countries. worst possible scenario I share with you is the combination of both. Where were you in August of 2003? Remember the Northeast blackout? <clears throat> Remember, what, 40 million people without electricity, people stranded for hours in elevators, little communication, no... And by the way, it was a a limb outside of Cleveland that disrupted a line and everything. What if that had been a attack on the grid, electronic attack on the grid, and had been accompanied by some physical attacks in communities that suddenly were without power? The convergence of both global challenges is something that we shouldn't dismiss as unreal or impossible. Quite frankly, I think it's something that as we consider the threats to this country, while we consider them in isolation, we should be better prepared, and I'm quite comfortable. I believe there are people who have been worrying about this and thinking about what happens if the two converge in the future. But these permanent changes in how we live and operate in this world are going to continue to pose challenges to us for a long, long time. By the way, I didn't mention transnational crime. A lot of your seminars are about criminals and dealing with crime on the street. I appreciate that as a former DA. By the way, I was a defense attorney, but when you run for Congress, you don't emphasize you were a defense attorney. <laughs> There's not a warm, fuzzy feeling for those folks. So I emphasize that I was a prosecutor. Actually, at the end of the day, I probably enjoyed putting people in jail more than the other side. Maybe the ones who really deserve it. Some people just shouldn't be on the street. But let me give you a caveat here, and it's just Tom Ridge's opinion. And it flies into the face, it's not a political statement. I just agree with the notion that you treat terrorists as criminals. I just do. Why that, Tom? Well, I never met a criminal that wanted to get caught or cared if they got caught. 
I never met a criminal, I never met a criminal who was willing to die in the exercise of the criminal activity. There's a different mindset. And I think we need to understand that. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out why do terrorists act like they do? How do they justify killing innocents? Randomly in many instances, the barbaric actions that they take. Folks, you're wasting a lot of time because the way you were raised and the countries within which you have been raised and the culture with which you're associated, you'll never be able to figure it out. You don't have that mindset. So instead of trying to figure out why they do it, we just better be prepared for what they might do. And we'll let the academics try to sort it all out, but you're operational. You want to help reduce that risk. And to that end, I just have a couple of thoughts I'd share with you with regard to the convergence of technology, information, and the work you do at the Institute. first challenge I think we have is to remind ourselves that we are in the risk management business and not going to eliminate it. That's what DHS was. You never eliminate the threat, you got to manage it. It's a mindset that a lot of people don't appreciate or understand, but I think it's absolutely critical we accept that as the reality. Perfect security should be the goal, but we have to be realistic. We're never going to achieve it. The second is we really need, and this is where technology is really important, whether you're dealing with terrorism or the digital forevermore, you want to layer in defenses. Homeland Security, when we thought about it, we wanted to, we wanted to make our natural borders the last line of defense, not the first. So that's why the tip of the spear was the intelligence community, our military. You want to deal with terrorists and terrorist actors as far away from the border as you possibly can. Your perimeter is the last line of defense. You try to identify and combat the enemy before they permanently penetrate the interior. That's why even in the digital forevermore, trying to build security around government systems and IP property belonging to corporate America, you layer in different kinds of technology. But by the way, you better not be thinking just in terms of perimeter defense. That's old school. Somebody said about a year and a half ago, and I recall, can't recall the name, but he was said, we've always repeated, there are two kinds of companies. Those have been hacked and know it, and those have been hacked and don't know it. <laughs> so you want to maintain that perimeter defense? Yes, but it's got to be an integrated defense. There's software available to embed in the system to identify immediately. So you don't, you understand, you can't secure a perfect world, but you better have integrated defenses. I say this to a lot of people in the private sector, though, and because we do some security, cybersecurity work there, we have to stop looking at security investments as an expense. It's an investment. You don't hesitate providing for insurance. It's an insurance policy. There's still a lot of people in the private sector, although even after Target, Walmart, and, and, and uh, Sony, I think their attitude is changing. They still think it's an IT problem. It's not, it's a business risk. And you better understand that. Security is an investment, it's not an expense. I think at the end of the day, information sharing is at the epicenter of all this that we're trying to do. We need total situation awareness. I don't care who's a cop on the beat. <clears throat> the soldier on the battlefield and everything in between. You need timely, relevant, and potentially actionable information. One of the things I've been doing on my, on my own time, because I believe in it, is trying to work with a group of private sector companies to build a legal pathway so they can share information, particularly cyber information, to the federal government and that the federal government can share it with them. <laughs> Because a lot, I believe companies are probably dealing with it in even more aggressive, certainly more frequent, perhaps more aggressive cyber incursions than even the federal government. At least they have to be sharing that information, but they need a, they need a pathway that's protected, a safe harbor, so that they share information. Somebody doesn't go out and get a Freedom of Information Act and say, XYZ company was vulnerable, let's regulate, or XYZ. 
I mean, it's a really complicated situation we have out there, but so we gotta figure out a pathway so that information can go in both directions. But particularly from the federal government on down, that shouldn't be a problem, but from the private sector on <coughs> up. When I say to some of our smaller clients, some of our clients, you, you all here understand it, so I know I'm preaching to the choir. When you take a look at your technology, you can't be selling a technology. Your capabilities have to match requirements. And if your capabilities don't match requirements, forget it, you're wasting the procurement officer's time. I remember one time we had a client who had this wonderful piece of the technology. It was fabulous. And I turned to the CEO and said, great, let's go buy it just wasn't what the government or the private sector needed in my judgment at the time. You know, thought. The other thing I say to my friends in government, you can't make the perfect the enemy of the good. There's some great technology out there, but I'm sure that from time to time people say, but if they only added this or they only added that. No, no, if it's, if it's out there and it helps reduce the risk today, get it and let 2.0 or 3.0 a couple years from now mature up. Let it mature and then let you think about adding it on to the existing protective infrastructure you're developing. Sometimes we have a tendency to say, well, it's not exactly what we want. Well, but if it helps substantially reduce the risk, mitigate the risk, you know, I don't quiet. And then finally, and this is probably music to your ears, but I believe this. We've, we're pretty labor intensive with everything we're doing in America these days. Right now, I think the big challenge isn't put people at points of vulnerability. We need to put technology at points of vulnerability and make sure we got the people trained well enough to use them. But technology at the end of the day is going to be the answer. And that's where you come in. I know there's probably some frustration because the procurement cycle within government is pretty slow. One of the challenges I think we have, you probably have, when you take a look at what you do, do it, and do it every single day, is technology moves faster than government. Actually, most glaciers do. <laughs> <laughs> so you're on the cutting edge of some really, some really, not only discoveries, but solutions, but getting into the procurement mix within government continues to be a serious challenge. And I dare say, there are men and women who work in government that agree with you, but they're bound by the rules and regs. So when you're looking at the individual across the table and you're frustrated that we've got, it's not a perfect solution, but it's a lot better than what you have, that person with whom you're dealing is just kind of constrained by the regs. And until people get a sense that there's a lot of redundancy, we're wasting a lot of time, that the innovation, in the entrepreneurship within the private sector to help government do its job more efficiently, but also to help <coughs> solve the problem that the government has identified is frustrated just by the slow nature of embedding new and better technology into government itself. So until that realization is had and changes are made, the Institute continues to be play a very important and vital role. Because you understand collaboration, you understand about communication, you understand the very nature of the public-private partnership. I'm not quite sure you've been enlightened by anything I've said, but I'm certainly grateful for the opportunity you've given me to say it. <laughs> it's a great organization you have here. There's a lot of frustration dealing within government. I understand that. Let's say even a nine little shop. And you've got big shops. You're onto something here, and I'm uh, grateful for your participation. I used to say in Secretary of Homeland Security, everybody in America has a role to play to keep America secure. Believe it or not, everybody has a role to play. Your role has been elevated somewhat. I applaud the role and your participation in it. Thank you very much. <laughs>